but we also would expect certain differences to have accumulated since they've gone their separate ways. I'm happy to take any questions of clarification there. I know you're not biologists, so it's always a bit of a challenge for me to make sure it's accessible. How are we doing? Feel free to interrupt as we go. Okay? So we'll open the book of the human genome, open the book of the chimpanzee genome, and see if they, how they match up. There are a number of things that we're going to address in this talk. The first one is this issue of homology. You've probably heard this if you're at all interested in the human sort of the evolution discussion. You've heard the homology argument. Homology is just a fancy way of saying similarity. Okay? I'll talk about what redundancy is when we get there because it's part and parcel of what I mean by homology. Homology just simply asks the question, are human genes similar to, in this case, chimpanzee genes? Are they similar to one another? Synteny asks the question, are these genes between humans and chimpanzees in the same spatial order? Not only are the individual segments of DNA, are they similar to one another, are they homologous, but do we find them in the same relative orientation? Is it A, B, C, and A, B, C in chimp, or are they in a different order? And there are many, many, many genes in the human genome, so there's many, many possible orders. So this asks the question, okay, are the genes in the same order? Pseudogeny, or this issue of pseudogenes, is another issue. This asks the question, can we find any, this is sort of genetic archaeology, when we go digging in the chromosomes of these two different species, can we find any evidence of genes that are no longer functional, that perhaps were used at a different time and a different place in this organism's history? So it's kind of genetic archaeology, go digging to see if we can find the non-functional remnants of genes that used to do something way back when. Okay. And then persim persimony or parsimony is just the notion of what's the most, given these lines of evidence, what is the simplest explana explanation that encompasses and accounts for all of these lines of evidence together. If you've heard of Occam's razor, sort of the most, the simplest explanation for a given, for a phenomenon, that's what this is addressing. Okay. Starting with homology. Okay. Quick, write it all down. <laughs> what you're looking at here is the genetic sequence of one gene in many different species. The top, spe this, the top one is human, chimpanzee is right next to it, and then these various other species. The next one down is uh, dog, this is cow, this is mouse, this is rat, this is chicken, and this is a small minnow called a zebrafish. The gene that you're looking at is insulin. So you probably have, you have some sense of what this thing does. It's a small protein, hormone, that is secreted into the bloodstream that modulates our blood sugar level. If you're a diabetic, you have a problem with the cells that produce this protein. What you're looking at here is not DNA code. Again, this gets a bit beyond what time for biology class here if we had three hours we could talk about it. The DNA code is converted into protein code. Basically you can think of the, the DNA code as kind of like the template, the instruction set, but then that instruction set is physically turned into a different chemical, into proteins, and those proteins go and do the dirty work. So there is a genetic sequence, a DNA sequence that specifies this sequence of the protein and these are the building blocks of the protein. There are 20 different building blocks. They're called amino acids. Again, just like Lego, you stick them together in a sequence, you can make different functional combinations. So here's what the amino acid sequence, the protein sequence of insulin looks like in a bunch of different species. There are 110 amino acids in this in humans and chimpanzees. The point to make here is that there are only two differences at the amino acid level. Here's one change here, and here's one change here. Other than that, it's absolutely identical. So what we mean by homology is we would say that these two genes in humans and in chimpanzees are highly homologous. They're almost identical to one another. Now, what you'll notice as sort of the farther down you go, I've arranged these species pretty much in their proposed relatedness to humans. As we go down, 
the less related these different organisms are proposed to be, the more distant they are proposed to be from humans, you will notice the similarities begin to get less. So basically, we have a pattern of data at a gene level that exactly models what we would have predicted in the first place based on other criteria. We would have predicted this sort of sequence of relatedness based on morphology, anatomy, and physiology. When we look at the genetic level, this is just in one gene, we see that same pattern repeated. Okay. Now, that's the one argument. The common counter-argument to this line of evidence is to say, well, you know, insulin's got to be insulin. Insulin's got to do its job. If you're going to be a, a mammal and have insulin, then it needs to have this sequence of amino acid. So there's a constraint on function. The thing has to do its job, so those amino acids have to be in that order to do their thing. Now, apparently not if you're, you know, the one sort of rebuttal to that is, well, different organisms get by with insulin just fine with slightly different combinations. But you could say, okay, if you're going to be a, a primate and have insulin, it's going to have to be at least pretty similar to this in order to work. So this is where this argument from redundancy comes in. And now we're going to start looking not just at the amino acid sequence, but we're going to talk about the underlying DNA code underneath that amino acid sequence. Now, this is going to get a bit technical. So forgive me and feel free to flag me down. Let's just look at this little tiny snippet of amino acid sequence right at the beginning of insulin and ask the question, okay, what's the DNA sequence that underlies this? The DNA sequence is often represented just with a four-letter code. So here's just literally sort of a DNA sequence, A, T, G, G. Again, four different possible building blocks, four different letters. Those letters are read off in groups of three. And groups of three are used to set a specific amino acid. So basically, you read off three nucleotides in a row. That specifies what protein building block should go in that location. So here, for that first little snippet of insulin, we can look at the nucleic acid or DNA code that is underlying this similar amino acid sequence. So here's that one of those changes between humans and chimps. And you'll notice that there's only one letter difference between the DNA underlying this. Okay? And that one difference is what's giving us a different amino acid at this position. Okay. Thus far okay? Okay. The issue clear, is, clear is that... <laughs> it's clear as mud. Clear as mud, yep. The point that 